Thank you for joining us today. My name is Keith Larson and I am the president of the Louisville Forum. We typically meet on the second Wednesday of every month at Vincenzo's restaurant in downtown Louisville. But these days we are meeting virtually and sometimes like today, not on the second Wednesday. The Louisville Forum is a nonpartisan public issues group founded in 1984. We host debates and discussions of contemporary and sometimes controversial public policy issues that affect the greater community. Although we may take up issues that have a national interest, we try to highlight the local perspective. For more information on the Louisville Forum, our programs, or to make reservations, please visit our website at louisvilleforum.org. Our topic today is the state of education in the Commonwealth, the conversation with Kentucky Commissioner of Education, Dr. Jason E. Glass. While we usually host a panel of speakers to debate a topic, we do on occasion host an individual speaker or speakers if they are at the center of a very important issue. Today, March 17, happens to be the day set by the Jefferson County Board of Education to begin the phased in reopening of our schools. Like JCPS, schools across the Commonwealth are phasing in their reopening plans. As our schools navigate this process, they also confront the lasting impact of this last year, feeling the pandemic's impact from an academic, social, and mental health perspective. There's also a lot to discuss around the legislative session, Issues like school choice, a scholarship tax credit, a possible shakeup of the Board of Education, a quote, do over year, and full day kindergarten funding have all been working their way through Frankfurt. Given all this news, our speaker could not be timelier. Dr. Glass has been Commissioner of Education since September. He is a native of Brandenburg and a third generation Kentucky educator. As commissioner, he oversees the Commonwealth's K through 12 education system and recommends and implements Kentucky Board of Education policies. Dr. Glass previously served as the director of education for the state of Iowa, a superintendent of Eagle County Public Schools in Colorado, and as superintendent and chief learner of Jeffco Public Schools in Colorado. Thank you, Dr. Glass for joining us today. Um, I understand that you have also brought a guest and we very much appreciate that. Uh, but for now, we will turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Keith. And it's great to spend some time with you talking about something that I'm very passionate about, uh, education. And we have a lot to talk about uh, today. Uh, just a little bit more about my background. As, as Keith mentioned, I uh, am a third generation Kentucky uh, educator. My grandmother was a teacher in, uh, in uh, Summer Shade, which is a little community in uh, uh, Medcalf County. My parents were both uh, teachers. My sister is a teacher in Medcalf County now. My brother works for Kentucky Educational Television. I even married a teacher. So this is, this is our family business. This is what we do. Uh, so this, there's a deep passion for it um, that uh, runs, runs deep with me. I grew up in Brandenburg. I went to school at, uh, at uh, UK. Uh, I did, had my first teaching job in the Hazard Independent System in, in Eastern Kentucky. I uh, went to Colorado and had, had a couple of uh, uh, roles with the Colorado Department of Education, mostly working in special education, uh, worked in uh, nonprofits at the district level, um, uh, also nonprofit work in Columbus, Ohio. And then in uh, 2009, uh, then uh, Governor Terry Branstad in Iowa uh, called and uh, asked me to be the, the state director of education there. So that's the companion position to the commissioner here. So this is my second pass at being a, a state chief, um, but it's an honor to get to do it back in my, uh, in my home, home state. Uh, the two districts where I've been superintendent, one was Eagle County Schools, which is a district up in the mountains in the Rockies. Uh, it's about 7,000 kids, about uh, 18 schools, and, but it's over about 1,700 square miles. So it's geographically quite a large district. Uh, then the, uh, the second district where I was just before coming to Kentucky uh, was Jeffco Public Schools, which is the uh, district on the western sort of third of the Denver um, metro area. Uh, and it's, it was a, it's a large district. It's also Jefferson County. Um, it's a little bit smaller than uh, Louisville, the Louisville uh, Jefferson County District. But we had about 85,000 students and about 170 schools in Jeffco uh, Public Schools. Uh, I've got uh, two kids that are um, in 
in school in Fayette County. We live in Fayette County. And so uh, we, we've been thrilled to move them back to Kentucky. Um, when we, we talked about them, uh, talked to them about coming to Kentucky, they were sure Kentucky was a, a paradise because every time we had brought them here, their grandparents took them out for ice cream, took them to the lake, uh, took them bowling, took them to play games. Every day was a, was a party. So they were pretty sure that's what life was going to be like uh, when they relocated here. It's been uh, a tough uh, several months as for all of us as, as we've uh, navigated through COVID, but I'm really grateful for the Fayette County system and the support that they've provided for our family and, and, uh, and the work that they've done to get our kids back uh, in person. And congratulations to uh, Jefferson County um, Public Schools. I know that uh, parents have been uh, wanting and the students have been wanting and the teachers have been wanting uh, to find ways to get students back in person. Um, and, and I'm glad to see that happening in, in Jefferson County. It's a, it's a great day for kids and families in, in Jefferson County. So uh, it's a, a day for celebration on, on a number of levels. Um, I wanna talk just a little bit about um, some of the things that we've been working on just in my time here at uh, the Kentucky Department of Education. I started in this role in September, right in the middle of uh, managing all of the uh, COVID disruption. Uh, schools in Kentucky, uh, work to implement what we call the Healthy at Schools guidance, uh, which laid out procedures around how to operate schools safely um, uh, under, the, under the threat of COVID. It included all of the things that we've now become accustomed to and familiar with around temperature checks and sanitation and masking and ventilation and, and uh, social distancing and spacing. Uh, that's complicated in a school uh, because education um, is largely a communal activity. You group up in together and you do this from, fam from groups that are outside your home. So that made it difficult. And also schools are not really uh, set up to manage viruses uh, very well. So uh, people have sometimes asked, well, how can I, how can I get on an airplane and not, um, how can we not open the schools? Well, ventilation systems in some of our buildings that are built in the 1920s and 30s are not certainly not built to do that. And, and a lot of the filtration systems were not built to handle uh, uh, viruses or removal of viruses either. So lots of challenges when it came to implementing uh, in-person learning. We saw that happen across the state. Um, school districts moved in and out of in-person learning, sometimes using uh, lots of virus mitigation strategies, uh, offering in-person learning, sometimes using what we call hybrid models where kids were in school some of the time and out some of the time. Mostly the reason to do that is to reduce the number of people that are in the building at any one time. Uh, and then we had a couple of districts, a few districts, including Jefferson County, uh, that remained uh, all virtual for this period up, up until uh, today. So there were a variety of different approaches. Most of the uh, districts in Kentucky were offering some kind of in-person learning, although the, the varieties of that vary greatly from one uh, community to the next. But the, the grounding element they, that they had, and they still have, is that Healthy at Schools guidance document, which lays out how you can operate schools safely. Uh, that was put together in collaboration with public health and with the staff at, the, at, at KDE. And it has largely been successful and effective at keeping our schools from being a vector by which viruses spread in communities. Uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm sure that it happened, but we have no verified cases of school transmissions uh, in Kentucky. So. Uh, I, I think it's hats off to the Department of Public Health and, and that guidance document, and also to our practitioners in the field who worked really hard to keep learning going and also keep our community safe. Uh, like all of you, um, a lot of my life and, and the lives of the staff at KDE have all COVID all the time. Uh, so it's been a lot to manage and it has taken over a lot of the conversations that we've uh, had, had to have. Uh, there really hasn't been a lot of space uh, for other things, but we do have to work on uh, things outside of COVID, especially as we're coming to the, uh, nearing the end of this pandemic and start thinking about how we transition back to some semblance of, of uh, life as normal and think about how we can recover uh, from this and support, out, support our kids on the experiences that so many of them missed out on over these past uh, few months. Uh, another priority that I had coming into Kentucky was a focus on uh, equity and anti-racism. Uh, just in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder um, uh, this summer, uh, the killing of Breonna Taylor in, in Louisville, uh, and the uh, unrest that happened as a result of that, um, it really uh, created a, a compelling reason for us to examine as school systems, what are we doing when it comes to anti-racism and systemic bias and equity, and how can we be sure that we really 
meet that moral obligation that comes with being a public institution of serving every child and every family well uh, and making sure that, that uh, any kid, regardless of what background they come from or what their skin tone is, is served well in, in our public schools. One of the first moves that I made as a commissioner was to create a position of uh, chief equity officer and to bring in an exceptional educator to serve in that role. Uh, Dr. Thomas Woods Tucker was a colleague of mine uh, in Colorado. We actually had adjacent districts. I was just to the north of Thomas and he was just to the south. And so we competed uh, in that standpoint. Uh, Colorado has a, a robust open enrollment and public school choice um, uh, structure. And so Thomas and I were, were rivals, but also very respectful of each other and, and, uh, and uh, appreciative of each other. And so um, I was pleased to be able to bring Thomas uh, to Kentucky to lead this work around anti-racism and equity. He is a decorated and very capable uh, school superintendent, um, has been the national superintendent of the year. So we're really fortunate to have talent like this uh, at KDE. I'm going to turn things over to Thomas for just a couple of minutes to talk about our anti-racism and equity efforts. And then I'll pick up again once he's finished. Thomas, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thanks, Commissioner Glass. And thanks to members of the Louisville Forum for an opportunity to share a few words about you, a few exciting uh, words about you relative to some of the things that are happening with your Kentucky Department of Education. Uh, before I uh, get into uh, some of the things that I'm really excited about, I want to say uh, from my heart that we believe that all of our schools, all uh, every school district here in the Commonwealth uh, should be safe havens. Uh, where all students and staff, regardless of their background, uh, regardless of, the, of their ethnicity, their religion, their sexual orientation, uh, or gender identity, or national origin, feel safe and welcome. And so that's the first thing that we want to ensure. And I think that's the first step we need uh, to take in, in terms of ensuring uh, students are, are in an equitable environment that they first and foremost feel safe. Your Kentucky Department of Education uh, in our strategic plan, identify four strategies. First, equity, student achievement, collaboration, and integrity. Uh, upon coming to the department and having the great pleasure of working with Commissioner Glass, I uh, discovered that the Kentucky uh, Board of Education, uh, back in July, affirmed its commitment to racial equity and racial justice in all schools in a resolution that stated in part, and I'll briefly talk about three parts of it. First, that educator must, all of our educators must embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion, because that's gonna be key to shaping the future of our students. And secondly, every student in the Commonwealth deserves equitable access to excellent educators who bring unique learning experiences. Again, we go back to, uh, ensuring that our schools are safe havens. They are safe havens for students and staff of all different backgrounds. And we need to have educators who reflect those various backgrounds. Then also, and equally important, that educators, schools and districts must commit to listening to their students. We need to be uh, committed to ensuring that students who have been voiceless, staff members who have been voiceless in the past, feel valued and safe in their schools and feel a part of the community. Uh, Commissioner Glass. Thanks, Thomas. Appreciate you being on. And Thomas will be available if there are questions that come up about our anti-racism and equity uh, work. Uh, Thomas is, is leading that. He has my full uh, support and engagement in that work as well. So we'll both be available. Uh, shifting gears, one of the things that we're grateful for with uh, the Kentucky General Assembly being in session is that they have given us something else to talk about besides COVID. Um, so that's, that's been a, a benefit, if, if anything. A few of the high priority um, pieces of legislation that we've been paying a lot of attention to and that you may have seen in the news. One is House Bill 178 that deals with the reorganization of the Kentucky Board of Education. Uh, what's happened, uh, with, what happened with the Kentucky Board originally was it was created and the commissioner's role was created to try and depoliticize education. Uh, to remove education from the political fray and have it administered and overseen by uh, professionals and, and community members from across the state uh, who could transcend uh, partisan politics. 
uh, what, regrettably, what's happened over the past couple of years uh, has been the politicization of the Board of Education and the commissioner role. Uh, we've seen boards of education uh, come and go. We've seen a few commissioners come and go. And so what uh, House Bill 178 was an attempt to do is create balance on the state board from partisan identification, regional representation around the state, and demographic representation in the state. So the state board looked like uh, Kentucky on, on a number of, of different levels. Uh, and it, it removed that sort of, you have a new governor elected who cleans house or wipes out the state board and you know, appoints people uh, that are all of the same party and then they bring in a new commissioner and here we go again. So it's to get off that sort of merry-go-round of, of the politicization, uh, politicization of, the, of the state board. Uh, so I, we are support, we're supportive of uh, House Bill 178 and the changes that were made with it. We think it's a good government move for Kentucky uh, to try and stabilize that uh, state board, stabilize the commissioner role, and stabilize the Department of Education. Uh, one of the exciting things that happened as this bill moved from the House to the Senate is the Senate uh, removed the teacher and the student member from the board. And of course, that ignited advocacy uh, largely among students, that, uh, several of whom were in Jefferson County. Our current student uh, member on the Board of Education is from Jefferson County, uh, and so she was in, involved in that as well. Uh, the reasons for that are that the, uh, the, the uh, Senate felt like uh, the students were not uh, developmentally uh, ready to uh, serve on, on a state board of education uh, and that the teachers could serve as sort of political pawns um, or agents uh, that would politicize the process. Uh, so that generated some backlash. Uh, it went back to the House uh, last night. The House refused to concur. So we had a disagreement between the House and the Senate versions. And now we know that a compromise has emerged uh, to put the student and the teacher member back on the board, but uh, have those positions appointed by that, uh, that state board at, that will eventually become more represent, re representative of Kentucky and remove some of the um, politics from it. So we think that's a good compromise. They did not, they ran out of time last night and were not able to act on that. But we think this is a good bill. It's a good government bill for Kentucky, removes uh, some of the politics from the education conversation at the state level. Uh, and we're, we're hopeful that the legislature will, will get that across the finish line and get it done. Uh, another high profile bill uh, that we've been tracking is House Bill uh, 563. It's an omnibus uh, school choice bill. Uh, and I want to say clearly that I'm not a, uh, an opponent of school choice. Uh, I've worked in Colorado, which has a very robust system of public school choice and charter schools. And uh, I was uh, successful uh, operating in a system uh, that with high levels of, of public school choice. And I, I believe it brings some positive benefits in terms of um, Parental agency, parents have the right to decide where their kids uh, go to school. It also leads to greater uh, innovation um, and uh, the, the competition among schools can be can bring those positive aspects. Uh, however, it, uh, it is also, you have to uh, be careful that it doesn't exacerbate inequities, that it doesn't lead to further segregation of schools, that unchecked school choice can bring about, and that it doesn't undermine uh, the public school system, that it doesn't corrode, erode uh, the base of support financially and otherwise that public schools have. So um, I, I really think uh, public school choice is a mixed bag. It brings some positives and it brings some negatives, and you have to be aware of both emphasize the positives and manage the negatives. Uh, I'm concerned about House Bill uh, 563 uh, and the bill that is now passed out of both chambers um, and, and been concurred and is, is on its way to the governor's office because the public school choice elements of it are poorly vetted. Uh, and we have a number of states across the country who have uh, decades of experience in, uh, running public school choice that do not show up in this bill. So uh, I think Kentucky deserves a quality public school choice uh, framework and, uh, and what we have here uh, is going to lead to predictable problems of technical funding questions, constitutional challenges, uh, concerns around special education um, access, uh, potential discrimination against students, uh, and actually uh, disadvantaging students who are in their own communities trying to get into schools. There are some technical changes that we could make to this bill that would make it a lot better. But the fact that it was rushed through the session late without a lot of input is, is going to cause us problems as this moves toward implementation. The second part of that school choice bill is a uh, education tax credit uh, component where corporations uh, could uh, 
contribute uh, funds, donate funds to something called an account granting organization or an AGO. So you give the money to this uh, account granting organization. The account granting organization can skim off 10% of those funds for administrative purposes. And then they send them to um, any number of education service providers. Uh, so I have challenges with this um, for a number of reasons. One of which being that I think it's, it's just ripe for um, graft and corruption and uh, poor quality. Um, we don't have any control over who these account granting organizations are going to be. I don't know who they are, or uh, we won't know uh, what they're skimming uh, the 10% off the top for. Um, and um, we don't have any quality control over where the funds are going. Uh, are these going to evidence research-based programs? Uh, and there are uh, opportunities built into this to allow the education service providers that these funds go to to discriminate against students. If you're not the right color, if you're not the right religion, uh, if you have disabilities or something um, uh, that makes your education more challenging, uh, there's nothing that says any of these organizations can't discriminate against students. I believe in school choice. I'm a, a proponent of empowering parents, but if we're going to use public funds um, in, in school choice, then the funds need to really serve the public. Uh, I'm, I'm a believer in competition and that makes schools better, uh, but let's really level the playing field. If we wanna involve private schools and, and uh, fund them to serve some of our public school students, that's fine, but let's really level the playing field and make sure that they're accountable in the same ways that our public schools are uh, and that they're held to the same standards of serving every child in the public. That is our moral responsibility. So again, I, I think this bill uh, may have some positive concepts in it, but it's half-baked. Um, and it needs work. Uh, we're going to have a lot to do if this actually ends up passing into law to ensure that these funds are spent uh, appropriately. Um, the last element just on the legislature uh, that I'll touch on is uh, we pay a lot of attention to the budget. Uh, we're concerned that uh, the state has again failed to keep up its end in funding what's called the SEEK uh, uh, funding in the state. Uh, funding for schools comes from local tax collections and from a state equalization that's called the SEEK formula. Uh, the SEEK formula helps balance out uh, inequities when it comes to property values in the state so that you don't have these huge variations from one community to the next and the quality of education varying from one community to the next because of the property taxes uh, that they're able to collect. Uh, as the state has failed to keep up with its end of the bargain, all of those inequities that led to the famous Rose case that declared the state's system of schools unconstitutional in 1989 have come back. We have all of those same inequities back in place. So that's a major concern that another year is going and, and we're seeing the further erosion of that equity factor in the funding uh, formula. And um, the legislature has um, uh, decided to step into managing uh, federal funds that were intended to flow to local districts uh, as part of the um, American Recovery Plan uh, that is intended to uh, lift schools um, uh, back and support um, uh, learning uh, in the wake of COVID. Um, so we're going to, we have a time pressure on these funds. We only have two years to expend them. And that's a lot of money. It's nearly $2 billion. So uh, if the legislature is going to step in and micromanage these funds, we're going to need them to work quickly. Uh, and we're going to need to caution them that they can't put forth edicts uh, and directives on things that are in conflict with the federal law that already has parameters on how the funds can be spent. So a couple of things that we're keeping track of um, just legislatively. Uh, I'll close um, uh, just by talking a little bit about a future vision uh, for the state, which is really where I want to get our, our conversation to. We, we get um, caught in talking about things that are sort of crisis-based, like, uh, like the Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and the, the out, uh, fallout from that, uh, managing COVID, the latest thing the legislature is doing. What we really need to be talking about is what's the future of education in the state and how do we prepare mm -hmm. our students for a world that is going to be faster when it comes to globalization. The economy is going to get even, even faster and more globally interconnected. It's going to become more automated. All, anything that can be replaced by a machine is going to be. And how do we prepare our students for an economy that's like that? And information is going to just become even more ubiquitous, instantly available, and all around us. Uh, so data is going to move faster. Uh, and that, those trends are not slowing down. Uh, they're not going away. And if we have an education system that's largely built on memorization of basic content and facts, 
um, and the ability to reproduce that in a standardized way, that, that doesn't prepare our kids for the complex world that they're going to go into and have to compete for, compete in. Um, so I hope that we can have a, a robust conversation as a state about things that really matter. And those are the experiences that our kids have. Um, we, we have focused a lot nationally and in Kentucky on macro level reforms, big statewide efforts, mostly around testing and standardization and school choice now as ways to improve learning. Uh, while standardization testing may bring about some positives, uh, largely that agenda has not resulted in increased performance or increased equity if we look at the data uh, in Kentucky and around the country. So these efforts are failing by their own measures of success. The only reforms that matter are the ones that change the experiences that students have on a day-to-day -day basis. Unless you're changing what the student is experiencing and preparing them for the complex and interconnected lightning fast world, automated world that they're going into, you're not really doing anything that's changing a child's future or, or uh, uh, trajectory. So uh, that's what I hope we can get to. We have some listening sessions set up in April and May. I encourage all of you to consider being part of those. I'll give a few minutes of an overview and then we're gonna spend most of the time uh, interviewing and listening to people and gathering data. Whatever future direction that we come forth with in Kentucky is not gonna be Jason Glass's vision and it's not gonna be the Kentucky Department of Education's vision. It's gonna be what we heard from the people in Kentucky that they want for their children and their aspirations for the schools in the state. Uh, with that, Keith, I'll conclude. Thanks for the time uh, just to share some, some thoughts. And I'd love to take some questions or hear feedback, uh, more importantly, uh, from some of the participants here. Sure. Th thank you so much, Dr. Glass. And, th and thank you, Dr. Woods Tucker, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate having you on as well. Um, well, we, we, we can turn it over to the questioners. Um, I think uh, Iris is up. Do you, do you have a question, Iris? Thanks, Keith, and thank you, Dr. Glass. We'll just go ahead and jump right in. Um, so the Kentucky General Assembly just passed legislation, uh, which has been now delivered to the governor, to provide districts uh, with the option to allow students uh, to have a makeup year. Um, so the question is sort of your initial reaction to that proposal, and then if districts like Jefferson County um, decide to take uh, that option, what kind of considerations do they need to make? And then also what kind of guidance will KDE uh, provide knowing that, for instance, the General Assembly did budget some money if districts uh, choose to go down this path? Well, it's a really interesting uh, bill and I understand the spirit that it came from. I think there's a recognition that students missed out on a lot this past year. Um, there were uh, once in a lifetime experiences that many of our students didn't get to have or students that uh, feel like they, they um, because of the learning loss that, uh, that students experienced this year, uh, they want to make that year up. So I understand that's, that's I, I think, the spirit or place that this, this came from, which, which I support. Um, I think it brings a lot of complexity when it comes to how do we fund uh, these students? Where is the funding for those students going to come from? Uh, there are lots of questions about athletic eligibility and other kinds of eligibility and what, what it means for that that we'll have to sort through. Um, but honestly, um, I think because it's just a one year um, provision, I'm not overly concerned about its impact. And, on, and also honestly, I think there are not going to be large numbers of students that take advantage of this. Um, most of our kids are not going to want to repeat a grade, or if you're a senior this year, you know, I want to going to come back for another senior year. Maybe there will be some, and I think that's who this, this is targeted toward. But the, the major challenge with it um, is, is really not the, the impact, it's in the management of the technical questions around funding and athletic uh, eligibility that we're going to have to work through. Nicole, do you have a question? I do have a question. This is one from the chat. Uh, the KBE recently diluted one tool for reporting on equity by changing in the new accountability regulation that N needed to report a subgroup from 10 to 30 per school. This will eliminate many schools who are currently reporting by different subgroups Please comment on why this was done, changing a standard that has been in place for more than 30 years. 
Yeah, the in, in calculation in um, accountability systems relates to how many students need to be in each subgroup before they count for or against a school in accountability. Um, there are um, uh, sort of a balance that states play when they make decisions around in count. If you increase the in count, which is what the Kentucky Board of Education did, it actually makes the data more reliable and more stable so we can trust it more. If you decrease the in count, you sweep more students into the measure. So there is this balance between, uh, between the two that states have to take into consideration. Kentucky has been a in count of 10 state for, um, as the questioner said, uh, several years. Uh, we are now an in count of 30, uh, which also a number of states around the country also uh, have this. And, and the US Department of Education provides sort of a regulatory framework around this. And they indicate you can be anywhere between uh, those two points. So the rationale really is to increase the reliability or trustworthiness of the data by increasing the in count. Uh, we, we did balance that in, uh, in our recommendation to the state board and what they actually ended up adopting in that it doesn't change the reporting. Uh, districts are still reporting the in count uh, down to 10 groups, uh, but it's how it's calculated and the ranking system for schools is what changed. So the data is no less transparent than it was before, uh, but there was this shift uh, to change the, change the metric on the accountability side to increase the reliability and trustworthiness of the data. And, uh, and Dr. Glass, to follow up with that, uh, you're absolutely correct. It all uh, public reporting uh, remains at 10, but it uh, also underlines the importance of our building leaders and teachers uh, having to not only just look at these numbers because we don't want uh, these numbers to be the end all, be all. We wanna ensure that there are faces behind these numbers that we're reaching out and seeing these students face-to-face -face and addressing any of their uh, shortcom academic shortcomings or, or challenges. Uh, yeah, in my comments earlier, uh, should have mentioned, uh, in addition to being the chief equity officer, I'm the deputy commissioner for the agency. And I also have the pleasure of uh, helping to lead the Office of Teaching and Learning. Joe, you got a question? I'm going to combine two questions having to do with the, um, I guess, school choice or ed education opportunity accounts. Um, uh, and if, and uh, Dr. Glass, you've already acknowledged, I guess, to a certain extent, but I'll go ahead and ask the question. Uh, it says, though administrators are concerned about what they are losing, do you acknowledge that Kentucky families are gaining access to choice and better outcomes? The other follow-up on that was, given your criticism of the uh, legislature's, uh, the, the bill as, as it was constructed, do you expect Governor Bashir to veto that bill? And are you calling on him to veto that bill? Yeah, um, we have asked, I'll answer the second part of that first. We have asked the governor to veto this bill uh, and we'll see what happens. The legislature certainly has the numbers to override any veto that the, the governor brings forth. Although the, the passage of this bill was quite close. Uh, it, it, on the House side, it passed by one vote to send it to the Senate and then one vote again uh, to concur with the, the Senate. Uh, last night and and uh, what will happen in a veto is that you'll have to get to 51 votes uh, so only one of those two votes that moved it out of the house was at 51 so i think the jury's still out on if this actually um, becomes law but uh, and again i would uh, stress that uh, i'm not an opponent of school choice i've spent most of my professional year successfully operating in uh, school choice environments and be and being successful at that um, but this bill is half-baked uh, and it's half-baked because it was crammed through late in the session without input uh, with language that I suspect came from out-of-state nonprofits. And so if we want to do this right, there are many other states that have enacted school choice legislation that we can learn from. Uh, and the legislature really doesn't have any reason to cram this through. The Republicans have such a majority that they can pass anything that they want. Uh, so why not slow down and make sure that the public policy that we put in place is well vetted, it's, it's benchmarked against other states that have been successful doing this. And so that's, that's what I'm uh, asking for is that we do that. I do not uh, concede or acknowledge that we're going to have better choices and better outcomes because of the education tax credits. I actually think because there are no measures that are associated with this, there are no assurances of quality about where the funds go or how they're used, we won't ever know if things are better or not. Uh, we just have really an unregulated um, system that I think is, is ripe for corruption, fraud and abuse and profiteering. Dr. Glass, we've been getting some questions from uh, our Facebook listeners. 
Uh, this questioner asks, the Biden administration said states have to administer federally required tests this year, but schools won't be held accountable for the results. What are, his, what are your thoughts on how the state will plan to do this? Yeah, the outcome, uh, or what, what was uh, one of the first decisions, major decisions that came out of the Biden administration. Uh, it says, sorry, my co-host is joining me here. Our dog Sonny's uh, circling around behind me. Um, but the Biden administration uh, said that states needed to give an assessment uh, this year, uh, but they could decouple that assessment from accountability purposes. Uh, I think uh, the decoupling of the assessment from accountability is the right decision uh, because this year has been so disrupted and we're still experiencing disruptions. If you have quarantines or students in and out of school, you can't control the testing environment. You can't control which students are testing and which are not, which leads to uh, data validity questions because there's systemic bias in who is taking the test and who is not. So we shouldn't be using that data to sort of rank and measure uh, schools. So I do support the element of decoupling it for, from accountability. Uh, I also support the notion that we should be testing students to see how they're doing this year. What I would have done differently if I were uh, the king of education in the country is, is I would have allowed local districts to use local, some local formative measures to uh, meet the requirement that students are testing and then make those results available to parents and students and, uh, and teachers. Uh, what the U.S. Department of Education says is you have to use the state test uh, to do that. The state test uh, takes three months to get results back. It's not very sensitive in terms of where students are uh, struggling because it's, it's a test that covers an entire year of instruction. Uh, so I think if, if we wanted quality data that would help us help inform us on where students are, the state test is not a good instrument for that. Um, so I, I, I wish they had done things a little differently, but this is honestly the result that we were expecting. Um, this, is, this is the configuration that we were planning for. And so what we've done uh, is we've worked with our test vendor to shorten the test as much as we can and still get valid and trustworthy data. So we've removed items so that the time that students spend in the testing environment is minimized to the greatest extent possible. We've been able to remove about an hour and a half to two hours of testing uh, out of most students' experience. Acknowledging that the time that we have them in person in school, especially in Jefferson County, is really limited. And we want to spend that on catching students up, building relationships, making sure that they're okay. So every minute that we have them in person is really uh, precious. What we've also done is expanded the testing window. So we've made it more flexible about when districts can take assessments. Again, acknowledging that if you have um, if you have a quarantining situation where you have to send half of your school home uh, for 10 days or something uh, for quarantining, uh, that's really disruptive and you need some flexibility on when students can test. So those have been the two responses that we made. Iris, you want to ask a question? Sure. I can jump in. Thank you, Keith. So Dr. Glass, uh, we received a couple of questions. I'm going to do my best to kind of mush them all together. So regarding comparisons of Jefferson County's approach to you know, do this hybrid approach of in-person learning with virtual options, how does Jefferson County compare to other county districts, independent school districts regarding like the timeline and methodology? Uh, realizing we are the largest school district and that does pose you know, tons of challenges, but overall, can you give us some statewide um, you know, observations and comparisons to put uh, this into better context for our group. Yeah, we really have had a mixture of different approaches used within Kentucky and around the country and honestly all over the world uh, to how, how schools managed COVID. Um, and they ranged from the transition to complete uh, remote or virtual learning uh, to those hybrid models, to having students uh, all in person in classrooms with lots of virus mitigation strategies. So uh, you have to think about the, the things, uh, the, the mitigation strategy schools use as layers. And the more layers of them that you have put in place, the safer things get. Of course, if you're sending everybody home uh, remotely and, and they're working on their computers, the virus is not gonna be transmitted that way, but there's a cost associated with that at all. Uh, and that we know that those experiences for most of our students were inferior to what we can deliver in person. Uh, and we saw, the, we saw the limitations of what relationship building that we can do on, on our devices. So, um, so really there, there was a mixture of, of approaches. I think uh, Jefferson County's 
uh, hybrid model is in line with what we saw uh, numerous districts do around uh, the state and around the country. And again, the, the hybrid model is an effort to have reduce the number of students that are present in, in a building. Uh, I think, you know, this is a, this is a challenge that we're gonna have just for a few more months to get through this school year. And we already have our educators uh, vaccinated, uh, appreciate uh, Governor Bashir and the Department of Public Health elevating them so we can get, get that done. Uh, we, we see uh, the restoration of in-person learning now required by state law by April 30th. Um, so all of our schools are going to be offering some level of in-person learning um, by then. And then I think we're going to go into the summer. We've got a lot of work to do around identifying where kids are struggling, how can we support them. And this is going to take us a couple of years to walk out of. We saw in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, uh, when New Orleans had to shut down schools, uh, in some cases for almost a year because of the devastation that was there, for many of those students, it took one to two years for them to recover academically uh, from that experience. And so that we have to be, I think, realistic about uh, what's happened and then the work that needs to come to, to lift our students out of that. Uh, we've got federal funds that are gonna help a lot with that, uh, assuming that the legislature doesn't intervene and direct those in, in some way that uh, isn't helpful to our, our, lo our local districts. Um, but I think, I think with the, the three rounds of federal funding that we've had, we're gonna have resources to do some really amazing things for kids and we should be excited about that. Nicole? Yes, I have another question from the chat here. Um, in 2016, we paid $5,708 instruction spending per child per Google. What is our cost today and how can we compete when other states spend three to four times per our cost? Um, how to make state, state legislators more aware on the importance of education? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not, sh I'll play the new guy card and say that I'm not sure what our per pupil spending is uh, as of today, but I can tell you it's not a lot different than it was in 2016. Uh, and that's because, again, the state is not kept up with its funding side of the equation, which is putting money into the SEEK formula in the state, which is causing all of those inequities to come back. Uh, so when it comes to school funding, there are two things to keep in mind. One is adequacy and the second is equity. Uh, adequacy means are you giving the schools the necessary resources they need to deliver on what you're asking them to do? I think we have adequacy questions in Kentucky. Um, if we aspire to be a globally competitive uh, state school system on par with some of the higher performing systems in the United States and the higher performing systems globally, uh, we have to ask questions about are we spending at a level that allow that provide schools the resources they need to do that? Sometimes people wanna argue that money doesn't matter, to which I would say, come on, uh, money matters in everything. When it comes to schools, it matters in what your class sizes are. It matters, can you provide gifted and talented services? Can you provide counseling services? Can you provide career technical education experiences uh, for your students? Can you offer STEM programs? If the resources go away, you're pushed back into offering a very basic and a very limited education model. Which again, looking to the future, uh, we, the world's only gonna get faster and more complicated. And if we want our kids to be able to compete and our businesses to thrive, we're gonna have to invest in education and see it as a workforce uh, development tool. Um, the, the second part of, uh, aspect of what you have to pay attention to when it comes to school funding uh, is equity. Uh, and that means, uh, are we sending resources across the state in a way that there aren't these huge variations from place to place? Uh, if we purely rely on property taxes, you're going to have some communities that are winners and, and losers. Um, I'll, I'll say that our neighbors across the north in Ohio, where Thomas spent a lot of his year, years working, they were a better system when it came to adequacy, the per pupil amount that were that students had available, sometimes five or six thousand dollars more per student uh, than we have in Kentucky. They were also a system that struggled with equity. You'd have massive variations from one community to the next based on the property values uh, in, in Ohio. So uh, Kentucky, I think, is going to have to go to work on both of these. We're going to have to think about, are we willing to invest in public education so that it can be successful? Uh, and are we willing to do the work around equity to make sure that all of our schools have uh, what they need? 
I'll stress that 93% of the kids, uh, maybe 90, about 94% of the kids in schools in Kentucky are in public schools. So we can tinker at the edges with these tax credits and privatization schemes. Uh, but unless you're doing something that is impacting the experiences of the 93, 94% you've got in public schools, you're not moving the needle. Uh, investing in public schools and supporting them and being successful it will be the most impactful thing that we can do to prepare our kids for their future. And uh, Dr. Glass, if I may add, in addition to improved funding, we need to ensure that our students, each of our 650,000 students or so, has access to uh, high quality, grade level, appropriate learning opportunities. And that's through our Kentucky Academic Standards in terms of what students uh, should know and be able to do. And recent research is also showing, in addition to high quality standards, rigorous standards, we need to ensure that students have access to high quality instructional resources that are aligned to the standards. And, and also we need to ensure in each of our schools that uh, our staff uh, have the requisite skills to create a robust uh, curriculum for each student, regardless of his or her ability. Keith, on that note, if I could, uh, this is Joe again, Joe Arnold. Um, I, we, and the next question is about funding um, and kind of a redirect, Dr. Glass, on your earlier comments. You, you predicted uh, corruption by the groups who would administer education opportunity grants, skimming the 10% off the top. Do you have similar concerns about top heavy school districts and non classroom related spending? Well, I think every school district has to examine its budget and think about our funds going to serve uh, students. Um, and I, I think we can, um, we, we can look at the spending that's occurring in districts and see that uh, the vast majority of funding that goes into public education is going into uh, buildings and classrooms and, so, and supports. So I think if you look at the central office spending um, and, and uh, I haven't looked at all of them in every district in the state, uh, but the districts that I've worked in uh, and, and uh, is typical in, in uh, public education around the country, it's a small fraction of, uh, of this entire spending that the districts are making. So I think that this argument that all of the money is going to these fat cats at the central office uh, is just a ruse uh, and that the data doesn't support it when you look at all of the money that's, that's being spent. Okay, um, Iris or Nicole, anyone have a question? Sure, I can jump in. Uh, so Dr. Glass, you, you sort of hinted at it, um, but if you can spend a bit more time. So, you know, Kentucky is waiting, just like many states, to receive further guidance uh, from the Treasury regarding how these federal funds uh, from the Recovery Act uh, can be spent. So recognizing that there will be a dedicated pot of money to school districts, public school districts, sort of what are the priorities you hope to instill and to promote um, to ensure that we maximize those dollars? Yeah, well, uh, with the second round of ESSER funding, well, well I'm sorry, I, I used a, uh, an acronym, I apologize. It's something that it comes almost reflexive to educators. We ac acronymize everything. Uh, but there are sort of three rounds of education funding that uh, it's sort of um, elementary and secondary aid or ESSER aid uh, is what, what they're called. So the first round of that, uh, we got uh, late last year where the second round of it is being distributed now. And the third round is what's on the horizon that, that we talked about that the legislature is, is stepping in to uh, um, manage some of the spending related to that. What I really hope districts do with this, these funds, what we provided guidance on, and we've actually provided an incentive to districts at $75 per pupil if they're willing uh, to do this, is provide what we call direct services to students. Uh, so going back to uh, some of the, the previous question, uh, how do you get uh, use the funding to put money into things that go directly to serving kids? So lowering class sizes, offering summer school programs, extended school year, extended school day programs, so weekend school, starting school early, uh, sending kids on trips and experiences that they otherwise uh, wouldn't have. Uh, how can we spend funding on uh, making up for special education services, speech language, uh, mental health services that students have missed out on. 
uh, there's a whole lot of catching up to do. And so we've incentivized and encouraged districts to use the federal funds for those purposes, which we think was the, the intent of them. Uh, it's intended to make up for what students missed out on as a result of the pandemic. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful and we're supporting districts and incentivizing districts and spending the money exactly in that fashion. I'm going to uh, ask a, a question that appeared in, in our chat here. Um, school districts have received lots of federal funding, which they seem to be allowed to just hold on their balance sheets for years. Would you support and can you order districts to use that money to keep schools open through the summer and help kids start to catch up? Well, uh, when it comes to the, uh, this most recent infusion of federal funds, which these, these two rounds are the largest uh, federal expenditures in education ever. Uh, so it really is a, a large scale investment or expenditure in public education. Um, you, uh, you, you can't hold those on your balance. If you don't spend them in the next uh, two years by September, 2023, you have to give them back. Uh, so this provision of the law would prevent schools from sort of holding it over uh, on their balance. So that's not going to be a problem uh, with these funds. But uh, uh, similar to the previous question, I, I would absolutely encourage and support uh, school districts to use their funds for the things that the questioner mentioned, the summer schools, the extended learning opportunities. Uh, that I, I think is a, uh, exactly where schools mm -hmm. should be should be putting their resources. And I don't have direct authority. So the federal law says these funds go to local school districts. There are some parameters that are put on how schools can spend them, uh, but the local district has, a, has, has the authority to determine where they're spent. What we've done at KDE is provide an incentive to say, if you do these things, if you spend money directly on services for students, we'll actually add to the money that you're getting. You'll get even more. Um, so we'll, we'll see how many districts of our districts take advantage of that, but I would expect uh, districts have got some costs related to uh, protective equipment and, and masks and shields and hand sanitizer and ventilation systems There's some of that that they needed to buy. But what, I, what, I, what I'm hoping is that they'll spend the lion's share of these funds on things that are directly serving students. Well, I, I guess just one final question, and it's kind of a generic question that that summarizes a lot of what we've we've seen on the question boards. And, and I want to emphasize to people again, you know, feel free to uh, you can text me in future meetings, or you can I think you can even quest, uh, post questions on Facebook. Um, but just sort of a generic question, you know, just generally, what are successful school districts doing, and uh, what can we do? to ensure that as many of those here in Kentucky are, are doing those things? Well, I'm a big believer in international benchmarking. Uh, and I really came to that, um, that work when I was the state chief in Iowa. Because when you work at the state level, the challenge is really how do you raise the performance of schools all across the, the entire state? And so one of the things I did was start looking at other countries around the world and see where we saw successful international systems and what were some of the things that they were doing. Um, so the recipe is really pretty straightforward and it's different than what we focused on in the United States. In the United States, our energies have been focused on standardization, testing, accountability, and the expansion of school choice. Uh, we don't see um, that as a reform agenda that are used in high performing global systems. Typically, they spend a lot of time investing in the teaching profession and thinking about how they can train and support teachers, how they can get the best and brightest people in their society to go into teaching and remain uh, teachers. Uh, so that's a major emphasis is investment and, and support for the teaching profession. Uh, we see a focus on um, high uh, standards uh, and robust experiences for students, providing uh, those high quality resources uh, like uh, Dr. Woods Tucker uh, talked about and holding students to high standards and exposing them to a high um, a, a rigorous, a challenging curriculum. That's a hallmark that we see in high performing systems. And we also see an effort to customize instruction uh, to where students are. So whatever their aspirations are, whatever their needs are, that there's an effort to customize the educational experience um, uh, to the student. And then wrapped around um, all of that, or maybe the foundation of all of that, 
are quality early learning experiences. So you see a lot of investment in early childhood education, uh, universal uh, kindergarten experiences. Those are the kinds of things that we have seen uh, international high performance systems be successful at implementing across really a variety of different contexts from Asian systems to um, uh, the Canadian system, several of them are high performing and European systems. So across different contexts, different cultures, different economic systems from systems that are uh, heavily capitalist to systems that are more uh, socialist, um, you, you see a really common set of approaches in these high performing global systems. So I think those, are, th those give us the, um, a map for the things that we should be spending our time and energy on here in Kentucky. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Glass um, and Dr. Woods Tucker. Uh, on behalf of the entire Louisville Forum, uh, we thank you for being with us today. And we thank you for uh, your role in, in helping us guide the state through these very important times. Um, our next meeting uh, will likely be held on Wednesday, April 14th. Uh, we have not yet selected a topic, but as soon as we will, we will get that out to the members and we will send out a Zoom link. And with that, we will uh, conclude the meeting. Uh, thank you, everyone, and take care.